Well, you'll want to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Mark chapter 9. We are in point, or part number two of our three-part series on true greatness, a lesson in humility, or a lesson on humility. My, mom, my mother wanted to thank those of you who prayed for her surgery that she had on Friday. Of course, she's at home today, convalescing, as they say. She had uh, foot surgery. She had a toe broken and put back in place and a plate put in her foot that she broke several weeks ago when she tripped uh, in El Centro. If you remember, my mom had, had tripped on a curb and fell to the ground, and in doing so, she broke her, <clears throat> her foot. So the foot doctor, the podiatrist, uh, killed two birds with one stone, so to speak, fixed her toe and fixed her foot at the same time. She wanted to thank those of you who prayed for her, who remembered her in prayer, and uh, I know she'd much rather be here than home with her foot up in the air. She's got her foot up there laying down on her bed with five or six pillows. She looks like one of those Harley riders with their, uh, riding like this, and their, but her foot's up there in the air. Uh, continue to pray for my mom. She is not one of the kind of people that can stay down. She doesn't stay seated. She doesn't stay in one place. She's always doing something. She's always busy about you know, her work at home. And uh, she has plenty of energy to do that, and I think that's what was bothering her the most. She called me uh, Thursday night, and I could sense a little sadness in her voice. And I said, you sound a little sad. And she goes, and she started to choke up. She goes, I just don't like having to be down. I don't like having to not be able to do what I do. And she was really concerned about that. So be praying about that. So far, she's doing pretty well. She has a lot of her family around her, her daughters, her son, her grandkids. And so she's being looked over and watched over, and I think she is enjoying the attention. But after a while, it gets old, right? So pray that she can stay down. The doctor said it's going to be very crucial that you stay down for several days before uh, you start to venture off on that boot. She's got one of those Star Wars boots on her leg, right? You've seen those. And black Darth Vader boot, looks like that's what I call it. Well, notice the scriptures this morning. This morning we're looking at Jesus illustrates humility. Last week Jesus demonstrated humility. This week he's illustrating humility and he's using a child to make his illustration. Verses 37 or verses 33 through 37. Mark 9. They came to Capernaum and when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So taking a child, he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the first day of the week. And thank you for those you've called to be here today. We think of those who are not. We ask for your hand upon them, your blessing upon them. And may you bring them back next week. Pray for my mother. Jerry, Geraldine, we ask that you would uh, continue to work your healing work in her body, particularly in her foot. We ask that you would help her to stay down as she is supposed to. We pray, pray for your blessing on the word today. Lord, without your blessing on the word, uh, we cannot learn what it is that you want us to learn, nor can we apply it. So we pray that your awesome, mighty, powerful hand would be upon us this morning. Open our ears and our eyes. Speak to our hearts and our minds. Help us to ingest your word as it is preached this morning through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Our newlyweds are in church this morning, or at least one of them is. I think James was here last week, and now Brittany is here this week. Brittany, congratulations again. How's it going? Good answer. Good, 
If you remember from last week, we were to get, when we were together, we learned that in Jesus' conquest, if you remember that, when he comes again to rule, it says in Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, the kingdoms or kingdom of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. You remember that? <clears throat> and that's, that is a key truth. It, it is a, a key thought when understanding this passage that we're looking at here as far as a lesson in humility. Now, although Jesus, the first time, came to be a spiritual deliverer, he came to save his people from their sins, that's what the scripture tells us, he didn't set up his earthly kingdom, he didn't do that. Even though his apostles or disciples were expecting that and waiting for that and wanting that and hoping for that and believing that, that time is still to come. Now, Jesus told Pilate, if you remember, he told Pilate, that his kingdom was not of this world's kingdom. His kingdom isn't characterized by what is true about this world. They are not alike in any way. And this being reflected in our lesson on humility this morning. So here in this passage, and in the last one about faith, if you remember that, we see that that things aren't done here, or things are done here very differently than in God's kingdom, very different. Even expectations are very different than they are in God's kingdom. And how we live out our life and uh, what we reflect as far as uh, spirituality is concerned is very different than the world and the world's ideas. And it's being contrasted in this passage. The world, men's thinking, men's behavior, men's attitudes, and the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and God's thinking and God's attitude and God's behavior. It's being contrasted here. Greatness in God's kingdom is characterized by humility and self-sacrifice, and that is considered great in the kingdom of God. Humility, self-sacrificing, great faith. We saw in the passage before. These are heavenly attributes, and they'll be part of those in Jesus' future earthly kingdom who become followers of him in this life. Those attributes, humility and self-sacrificing and great faith, will be part and parcel of those who have learned to follow Christ or who became followers of him during the time that they lived on earth. And when we, get, when we finally get, when we say finally get, to the millennial kingdom, that earthly messianic rule of Jesus Christ on earth, which we are looking forward to, which the apostles Peter, James, and John saw his future glory on the Mount of Transfiguration just a few weeks ago, at least here in our passage. At that time, we will have been conformed into the image of Christ. By the time we get to the second coming of Christ, by the time we get to his millennial kingdom, by the time we return with him from heaven, with him having been raptured, Seven years prior to that, we will be completely and totally conformed into the image of Christ. Romans 8, 29 tells us that. Having full and complete faith and humility, not without fallen nature, not without our fallen nature, that inhibits us and we'll be every bit a part of who, you know, who we are called to be. Romans eight twenty nine. So the attributes of God and the, and the fruit of the Spirit will flow in abundance without inhibiting us in any way from the flesh. The flesh will not inhibit us in those days when we are fully and completely glorified. When we, with Christ, rule with Him during His earthly rule. Until then, we can find ourselves to be a, great, a, a lot like the apostles or the disciples in the first century. We see them there and we see them in the flesh, so to speak. We can be a lot like them, every bit like them, fleshly, carnal, earthly, human, flawed. We're a lot like them. Even when we're born from above, John 3 tells us we're born again, born from above, we can still demonstrate our fallen, unredeemed human nature at will. Right? Right? Paul, when, when writing to the Ephesians, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, 
And as you're turning there, when he's writing to the Ephesians, he had to encourage them to walk a walk worthy of their calling. You are called into Christ's kingdom. You were born into the kingdom of God. You are kingdom people. Not just in the millennial kingdom, but even in the spiritual kingdom of God that, it, that is alive and ruling and reigning today in heaven. And as kingdom people, as the king's kids, so to speak, as those, the Ephesians were being encouraged by the Apostle Paul to walk a walk worthy of their calling. With all humility, he says. With all humility. In fact, we not only, Paul not only exhorted the Ephesians in that way, he also exhorts the same, the Colossians in the same way. He exhorts even the Thessalonians in the same way. Apparently, although born again and possessing the Spirit of God, they weren't walking in the fullness of God as king's kids as they were supposed to be. So Paul says in, in verse 1 there, he says, Walk in a manner... Worthy of the calling with which you have been called. He's encouraging them, they're exhorting them to walk as they were. As we are to walk as we are. Children of God and worthy to walk that way. He tells them that. And he exhorts them even further. Notice chapter 5 in the same epistle. He says to the Ephesians, in 5.15, be careful, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise men. Be careful how you walk. The words be careful, as, as Paul exhorts the Ephesians, spiritual walk can mean to live carefully, not carelessly. If you were heading on a long trip, and as you got ready to leave out the door, your loved one said, be careless. <laughs> See how odd that sounds? One time when I was a boy, I was out in the desert on my dirt bike riding around, and I saw some friends there. Him and his parents were in a trailer, and I stopped to say hi to them. She gave me a glass of water or soda or whatever it was at the time, and I, I started my bike and got ready to take off again, and she said, be careless. And then she smiled. I had never heard anybody say that before. What, what are we supposed to say? Be careful. Be careful. So we're to live carefully, not carelessly, concerning, they were, us too as well, our spirituality. We should be taking care of that. King James says circumspe circumspectly. It kind of gives the idea of uh, deviating in no respect from the law of duty. We have a duty as king's kids. We have a duty to take care of our walk in Christ. To be careful about it. As the translation says, deviating in no respect from the law of duty. It's a responsibility that we bear as children of God. And those who walk spiritually in tune with God do so because they are carefully watching their walk. I think we get very careless about our walk with Christ. I believe we can see it in the passage of Scripture in Mark chapter 9 that the disciples were very careless about their walk and about their spirituality. Very careless about it. As a matter of fact, very self-centered about this whole idea of who they are and what they would be in the kingdom. And so those who walk spiritually in tune with God do so because they are carefully watching their walk. As Paul said, be careful how you walk. And then in verse 518, he tells them how that is to be done, right? He tells them how it's to be. He doesn't just give them an instruction or charge them or challenge them. He tells them how to do it. In verse 18, how does he, what does he say? Don't be getting drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. That leaves you rendered in control of of the wine in control of something other than your spirituality. So he tells them that wine was used quite often in the first century. They use it for a lot of things. 
a lot of times they would use it in the water to purify the water because the water was so bad. It's kind of like going to a third world country and drinking the water in a third world country. If you drink it in it alone, it can make you sick. So they would put alcohol and the fermentation of the alcohol in the wine would kill the bacteria and they were able to drink. Sometimes they would drink it without the, the diluting of the water. They forget to dilute the water and just drink the wine and if it wasn't the boiled down type that was reconstituted, which they do a lot then too, but just fermented as it was, it would dissipate them, control them. And you've seen somebody under the control of too much spirits, right? Too much alcohol. So he says, do not get drunk with wine, for this is dissipation, but what? What's the alternative for the Christian? To be filled with the Spirit, it gives the idea of continually being filled with the Spirit. Maintain a feeling of the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit, as he said in chapter 4 there and earlier in chapter 5, to be careful to walk a walk that is worthy of your calling. A walk that is worthy of your calling is a walk that is a Spirit-filled walk. So do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And then in verse 19, 20, and 21, he gives them a picture of what that looks like. What does it look like? Notice verse 19. What does it look like? What does a Spirit-filled person look like? Well, a Spirit-filled person is singing to one another, or speaking to one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. He is singing in his, and making melody in his heart to the Lord. He's always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God. The only way you can have this kind of an attitude of mind and heart is, is if your mind and heart is in focus and in tune with the Spirit of God. You cannot walk this way if you're self-focused and self-centered. You cannot. You must be self Christ-centered and Christ-focused and Spirit-filled, thus Spirit-filled. Always giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be what? The NASB says, subject to one another in the fear of God. The being subject there in verse four, uh, 21 is the, the idea of humility. That's the idea of humility, being subject one to the other. Not just for the sake of being humble, but in the fear of God. That's how he ends that verse there, in the fear of God. In other words, a life that reveres God in such a way that we obey his word. We obey his word. We have prioritized his word. His, his word has become the unction of my function. Right? Amen? <laughs> that was free. And so the, the being, you know, the subject is the idea of humility. And Paul had to exhort several of the first century churches in that way. The, with the idea of humility. So even with a redeemed soul and spirit, or soul or spirit, we still fall prey to our unredeemed, self-centered humanness and have to be reminded to walk a walk worthy of our calling, even to this day. And we have to be careful in this walk. We have to be reminded to be filled with the Spirit and not something else like our fallen nature. We can so easily be fall, filled with our fallen nature as a matter of fact, we're probably not careful enough to make sure that we are not filled with our fallen nature as we seem to be more than the Spirit. And that's not humble, but proud, and it seeks its own way. So those who have been called into God's kingdom, those who have been chosen by God and in, in a, into a fellowship with His Son, are called to walk a walk of faith, Without sight, we saw that in the previous passage, and we are uh, called to a life of humility, Mark 9, 30 through 42, and this, of course, this side of eternity takes a spirit-filled life, a life connected to the true vine, John 15, and in our passage this morning, Jesus illustrates humility to his disciples. He not only demonstrated it last week, but now he's going to illustrate it in this passage, and we'll see Jesus contrasting this world's attributes 
kingdom attributes, those characteristics of his kingdom. And I just put a note here, we don't have to look to any further source than the disciples to get a good representation of what humans are like, right? We are in good company. I felt quite consoled in my study this week when I looked at the apostles and said, you know what, they're just like me and I'm just like them. I'm in good company. And as I've alluded to, we also get a good representation as to what we will be when our salvation is total, full, and complete. A good representation. When we've been fully conformed into the image of His Son, where the flesh and the Spirit has been transformed completely. We're no longer subject to sin's power or even the presence of sin. We'll be totally, completely, and fully King's kids. So we get a picture of both sides, what the disciples were guilty of and what they would someday be, and it all holds true to us too, the redeemed. So let's go back to Mark 9. Let's go back there. Verses 33 33 through 37. And notice that after Jesus demonstrates humility in verses 30 through 32, he now illustrates humility in verses 33 to 37. And I wanted to read that again for the record. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them, what are you discussing? What were you discussing on the way? They kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, now he's, what he's doing is he's, he's got them alone, they're in the house, he sits down, that is a, a uh, rabbinical position, okay? That's what that is, a rabbinical position, a rabbi's position. Uh, when they wanted to teach a lesson to their students, the rabbi would sit himself down, kind of like I do in Sunday school. You ever notice those of you who come to Sunday school? I sit down in that bench that uh, Brian sits down on, I sit right here, right here. That's a rabbinical position. You sit down to teach. That's what he's doing in that passage of Scripture there. Remember, he and his disciples are are heading back towards their headquarters, which was Capernaum. He doesn't want anybody to know that that he's in the area. He wants private time with his disciples, and he brings them into into the house, the house, and he sits down. He sits down. It's about to teach him something. So he called the twelve and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. That that is the topic. That's the subject in which he is going to teach them about. It says it again there. Which verse is it? Verse 35. If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Why is he saying that? Because they were discussing on the way which one of them was the greatest. They had this discussion. We don't talk about those kind of things in public, do we? We don't discuss among ourselves which one's the greatest of us, do we? Have you ever had a conversation like that amongst your peers? Which one of you is the greatest? Which one of you is the best? We might think it about one another, right? But we would never discuss it. This is crazy. So that's why he says what he says there. He shall be last of all and servant of all, anyone who wants to be first. Then he takes a child, in verse 36, and he sets him before them, and he, taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me doesn't receive me, but him who sent me. Well, to start with, we want to answer the question, why did they need a lesson in humility? And I think we've, we've already have answered that to some degree already this morning because it isn't in our nature to be humble. It just isn't. It's part of our nature, and we're not taught that in our society. Our society does not teach humility as a great quality. Our society teaches humility as a weakness, not as a strength. You see how the roles are reversed in this earth and in the, in the kingdom of God and vice versa? Our society does not teach that humility 
is a good thing, not even in the least. So it isn't in our nature to be humble. And, and the disciples, much like us, illustrate this. It's not that we don't have the power in the spirit to be humble. We just can't accomplish it in the flesh. We cannot, empowered by our fleshly nature, be humble. We cannot, living in our fleshly desires, reflect the Spirit of God. People don't see Jesus in me when all they can see is Albert. It's kind of like the hymn writer said, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. That's true. That hymn writer was telling the truth about himself. I'm self-centered. I'm self-seeking. So much so that I have this desire inside of me to get away from God if I could. Or if I would. I would live for myself and not for him. The Lord, Jesus, chose 12 ordinary men to follow him, not supermen. That's all he had to choose from. Ordinary men, fallen men, men who had been greatly influenced by the religion of that day, which said, well, the priests lived it. They made these fancy robes, and they had these great long prayers out in the streets, and everything was saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. That was demonstrated by the culture and the religion of the day. I, number one, am the most important. And everybody was fighting for the top. Everybody wanted prominence in their own particular paradigm or their own circle of influence. It's just the way the culture was. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's the way it is in the world. So the Lord chose 12 ordinary men to follow him. And it's comforting to me. I'm in good company. They're just like I was. I'm just like they were. They're just like I am. <laughs> A lot of the New Testament is, is exhortation. It's admonishment. It's reminding us to walk right. Look at the New Testament. You'll see it over and over and over again. Epistle after epistle after epistle. Exhortation. Admonition, reminding us to walk right, to walk in the Spirit, to walk in obedience to the Word. You ever notice why it's, you see that so much in Scripture? You ever notice that? Because that just seemed to stick. He had to say it to the Thessalonians. He had to say it to the Colossians. He had to say it to the Ephesians. He had to say it to the Philippians. The only ones we don't see him saying it to is the Bereans who put the scripture on the top shelf and who prioritized it and studied it. Now, you ever notice there was never an epistle written to the, to the Bereans? Kind of gives you the idea that maybe they were doing all they could to live it out and didn't need correction. But notice verse 33 and 34. Notice the question the Lord put to them. They came to Capernaum. That's a fishing town where some of the disciples lived. And it's where Peter had his house. Matthew 8 tells us Peter had a house there. And when they had come to Capernaum, you remember verse 30 says they began to go through Galilee. And he didn't want anybody to know about it. I just said that because he wanted a private teaching time with his disciples. They've come full circle now. And they're back in Capernaum, verse 33. When he was in the house, possibly Peter's house, the house, he began to question them. So he goes from teaching, which is all fine and good, right? It's always easy to receive, receive teaching, but when the questions start to come, that's when it gets a little bit tighter on the collar. You mean I have to answer now? So he begins to question them, and here's the question he asks them. What were you discussing on the way? <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus is beginning to pry into their personal business. We don't like it when the man of God pries into our personal business. We don't like that. 
He's asking them about the topic or the content of their private conversation. They were having a private conversation, and the Lord wants, him, wants them to tell him what it was they were talking about. He wasn't in this conversation. It was amongst themselves. They didn't want him in that conversation. There's conversations that you and I have amongst our peers. We don't want the preacher to hear it, and we don't want God to hear it. Because it's not a good conversation. Shouldn't be having it if we're followers of Christ. We shouldn't be having these kinds of conversations amongst our peers. The Lord, in his boldness, and also in his desire to teach his disciples and to prepare them for what was coming, wanted them to fess up to what it was. So he's asking them about the topic or the content of their conversation. They obviously kept this conversation to themselves, and this is one of those kind of conversations that we don't want God to hear. And yet they're having it. I thought about this. Did they forget that God knows everything? <laughs> Didn't they just proclaim that he's the Christ? He's the son of the living God, therefore he is God in human form. Didn't they know that he would know the topic of their conversation? You can't hide from God. You can't hide it. Everything will be laid bare before him. As a matter of fact, we probably need to realize that God not only knows the content of our conversations, that God knows everything. He even knows the intent of our heart. I wanted you to turn to Hebrews chapter 4 for just a minute. You say, well, if God knows everything, why did he ask them? <laughs> well, that's a simple reason, right? He wanted to confront them. He wanted to use it as an object lesson. He wanted to show them that it's much different in his kingdom than in theirs. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. Look what it says here. The word of God is what? It's living. It means it's alive. It's alive. Active. Active means at work. I like that. God's word is not only living, but it's at work. It's not only alive, but it's at work. God's word is at work. And it's at work right now in your hearts. It's at work. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Here, Paul, or the, the writer of the Hebrews, is, is likening the word of God to the swords that were typical in those days. Those swords were super sharp, razor sharp. They were two-edged on both sides. And they would hack people like this. They would, they would go through a, a, a legion of soldiers, and because it was edged sharp on both sides, they could just hack, 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 hack. Has anybody ever tried to cut through a chicken bone or a, a beef bone? It's not easy to do. You've got to... <laughs> These would cut all the way through the bone. Cut a person in half. Like a lightsaber. Right? All the way through, all the way down into the marrow and on through it. God's word is living and active at work that way. It cuts all the way into the depth of your soul and it knows the intent of your heart. Right? Piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, where those swords can cut to divide the meat and the bone, the Word of God will divide the soul and the spirit, the joint and the marrow, and able to do what? To judge the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's why a lot of people don't get into the Word of God on a daily basis. It's too convicting. They don't want to be accountable to it. And there's no creature, what? There's no creature hidden from who? His sight. His sight. You see, they thought that if they, if they uh, removed themselves from Jesus and let him walk ahead of them uh, 100 or 200 feet or 20 or 30 yards, they could come over here with their little group and they could get into their little fleshly conversations and he wouldn't know. That's what they thought. Boy, were they mistaken. Boy, had they forgotten that they just a few days before admitted that he was God in human form. Here the word of God is being revealed as God 
because he is the living word of God. Here in Hebrews, the word of God is being revealed as God. Because it's a, he's the living word of God. The word of God is living because the word of God is God. John 1, 1, John 1, 14. Thus there's no creature hidden from his sight, right? No creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and what? Laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In other words, we live our life in the presence of this all-knowing God. Nothing can be hidden from God. Not even the thought. Yet they're having one of those conversations that they didn't want him to hear. They didn't want anybody to hear. They definitely didn't want God to hear. And how do we know that? Mark tells us in verse 34, they kept silent. They kept silent when he asked them, what were you guys discussing on the way? And they were like, oh. They forgot that Jesus knows all things. In fact, in Luke 9, 47, it says, but Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts. So Luke says in the parallel passage. And so they were suddenly faced with that truth again. What were you discussing on the way? And dead silence and no one dared answer. It's that kind of silence when they've been talking about you and you walk in on them, right? They're like... Oh. Fear embarrassment, guilt, hopeful, hopefully shame. When they've been gossiping about you and you walk in on them, those should be the emotions that are attached to that circumstance. Hopefully all those. Fear, embarrassment, guilt, hopefully shame. If there's none of that in gossiping circles, something's wrong with your spirituality. And what were they talking about? Verse 34. They had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. What? Can you believe that? Is that what they were discussing? Which of one of them was the greatest? Hadn't Jesus just told them of his pending death in verse 31? Hey, listen, guys, this was not very long after he had told them that he was going to go to Jerusalem. He was going to be handed over to the unbelievers, and they were going to mock him and scourge him and put him to death. And instead of concern for Jesus, they're arguing over who's the greatest. You've seen it. There's battling over who gets first place amongst our peers. Now Mark records a reluctance to say anything, but they kept silent there in verse 33. Matthew says they actually have the goal to ask him. Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And of course, by Mark's account, they meant among themselves. That's what they were talking about. Among themselves. Who was Jesus going to place as his chief executor? And they all believed that this was a subject worth arguing over, and so they were so intent on knowing who would be first that once the awkward silence kind of dissipated or broke, and they had been found out, Instead of coming to their senses and humbly apologizing to the Lord for that, for being so careless about their conversation, especially since he had told them just recently that he was going to Jerusalem and to die, and all they could think about was themselves. Instead of humbly apologizing, their carnal hearts must know. And in Matthew 18.1, they asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? By the way, since you asked... <laughs> Who is the king, greatest in the kingdom? Could you tell us? I want you to go to Mark chapter 8 for just a minute. Go there. Because there's something greatly reflected in this passage of Scripture. And it shows us how human they were, how carnal they were, how quickly they forgot. They're so human, they're so carnal. And they're so immature. They spent almost three years with Jesus. They're still not getting it. He shows them what's expected of them. 
as his disciples. Notice verse 34. And he summoned the crowd with the disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must what? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Hadn't he just said that to them a few days before? Whoever wishes to save his life, he must lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. That has nothing to do with who's going to be first, does it? Nothing at all. This has to do with humility and self-denial and self-sacrifice. And this is what it meant to follow Christ. He would carry a cross and they would too. They, would, they obviously had already forgotten this. Or maybe they never heard it. Never really heard it. Maybe they never really heard it. They have that knack to shut off that part of the mind that says, I won't accept that. Because they didn't want to hear it. Or well, whatever case, in their desire for dominance, argumentatively so, they asked Jesus in Matthew 18, 1, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And I just have a side note here if you're taking notes. The transfiguration, no doubt, had some bearing on who was the greatest among them. They just got off the mountain, Peter, James, and John. Peter, J, and J. The other nine were left on the ground, on the bottom of the base of the desert. They went up on top of the mountain. They came down. They said, what was going on up there? Why were you guys so special? Why did you guys get to go up there and we didn't? Well, because <laughs> we're Peter, James, and John. We're special. And so this argument broke out over why they got to go and not the others. The answer, they were obviously, there were obviously some among them that thought that they were greater in the kingdom. Could have went that way. No doubt by one of the three, or all three, they were letting everybody else know how great they were. They were told not to talk about it. They went down the mountain and talked about it. They just couldn't help themselves. After all, they were the chosen above the others to see Jesus in all his future glory, not to mention Moses and Elijah, who has seen Moses and Elijah since they went up into heaven. No one. But we did, Peter, James, and John. We must be the first in the kingdom. They were all of that, right? They were all they're full of themselves, right? They had to have inflated their heads. Another side note, I found out that it was culturally typical to argue over greatness or first place. Culturally typical to do that. To consider yourself above everyone else. I mentioned the religious system of that time. Remember Jesus taught, when he taught, he taught about sitting at, a, at the lowest spot of a table. When you go to a banquet, take the lowest spot. Remember he said that? Take the lowest spot. Because if you take the highest spot and it wasn't for you, everybody goes for the highest spot. I am myself and Adam and Jonathan are going to the Shepherds Conference in March. We're so excited about that. The Shepherds Conference at John MacArthur's uh, um, church. And I've been watching videos and stuff about the Shepherds Conference. There's going to be probably 4,000 men there. They keep all the doors, it's about 15 or 20 doors of the sanctuary. They keep them all closed. They've got all these booths on the outside, book booths. And all these men are hovering around. And I was watching a video, and I saw this when I went to the conference a few weeks ago. I saw this. When the doors open, guess what? Everybody runs for the front seats. Everybody runs for the front seats. It's funny, but it's kind of sad. Everybody running for the front seats, and I watched the video where all these men are just pouring through the doors, and they're, they're almost losing their footing, coming around the corner to try to get into a seat, you know. It's like that cakewalk thing, you know, where you walk and the music stops and you jump in a chair. Wanting to be in the front seat. Of course they want to be in the front seat. Everybody wants to be in the front seat, but there's not enough front seats, except for here in Imperial Community Church. Everybody wants to sit in the back seat. You're all fighting for the back seat, right? It was culturally acceptable in those days to sit in the highest seats. 
just to assume that that was your spot because it's you. It's you. Or praying and fasting in secret instead of in public. And we always flaunt our spirituality when in reality the flaunting of it shows us that we're not very spiritual at all. It's kind of a meat first culture. Sound familiar? Anyways, I think we have, a, a, have thoroughly answered that question. Why did they need a lesson in humility? It's obvious, right? And that leads us to Jesus' response to their question. Matthew 1, Matthew 18, 1. When then is the greatest, or who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus illustrates humility in verses 35 through 37. He takes this child, right? Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Taking the child, he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. I'm thinking that this answer was the farthest thought from their minds. I think they were really expecting that Jesus would say, Okay, well, Peter, I've got you planned to sit here. James, you're going to sit here. John, you're going to sit here. Right? Matthias, you're this. Andrew, I got this plan for you. I really think that they were expecting something very different. I know they were. Because of the attitude towards children in the world, Jesus uses them as an example. The attitude of children in the world. Children are lower. We are higher. Children are lower. We are higher. It's an adult world as much as it is a man's world, whether we like it or not. It's an adult world as much as it is a man's world. We don't say it anymore, but it's still true. It's still lived out. We still see it in our culture. It's still part of cultural thinking when it comes right down to it. Children are to be seen and not heard. This was obviously pervasive in Jesus' day. In Mark 10, Matthew 19, the disciples, after receiving Jesus' illustration, this comes later, you can go to Mark 10 and see it after Receiving this illustration of humility, they rebuked some for bringing children, infants, and toddlers to Jesus so he could pray for them. They rebuked them and said, don't bother him with the kids. And they quickly forgot the illustration as to who was greatest in the kingdom. And he rebukes them by countering their words, saying, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. They hold first place in the kingdom of God. That's what he was saying. Anyone who will humble themselves like this child will hold first place in the kingdom of heaven. What did he mean by that? Well, God has sovereignly provided for children. They have a place of significance in his kingdom even though children take a back seat in this world, often abused, often abused in many ways. Think of how children are treated in other countries, how they work in sweatshops, how they are abused, they're neglected, they're put down, they're, they're a burden. They get on my nerves. Even the family members are treated as an orphan of some sort. God gives them first place in his kingdom. And then when he was here in human form, he loved them. He held them. He prayed for them. He no doubt healed them. And he welcomed them, not only to his side, but he welcomed them into his arms. Maybe well, this was one of Peter's kids. We don't know. Maybe, maybe it was one of Peter's little ones. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't have a way of controlling birds in those days. They had bunches of kids, and maybe this was one of Peter's little ones in Peter's house. And the Lord went and got this little one, picked him up, and put him 
on his lap. He wasn't so high and mighty that children couldn't reach him. He didn't ignore them as if they were in the background where they're supposed to be quiet. They share in his love and they share in his affection. And that's humility demonstrated in all his greatness. He uh, prioritized the children. And he uses them here to illustrate humility. What does he say? If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all. Like who? Like this child who is last in the culture. Who is last in the culture. And you've got to remember that this is a reference to greatness in his kingdom. The world obtains greatness in totally opposite ways. Not like this. For those who choose to follow Christ, this is the way to greatness in his kingdom. This is the way. Instead of a fight for the top, it's, it's a placing of oneself last. We learned that in Philippians last week, if you remember. Do nothing for selfish or empty conceits, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. You want a good opportunity to do that? Humble yourself and help with the baskets. Help with the baskets. Humility is putting others on your things to do list in context. And from last week, Jesus set the supreme example of that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And this selfless attitude that looks out for the interests of others, he illustrates there in verse 36 and 37. Now we've already learned and is now being illustrated the whole teaching or lesson on humility centers around others and not self, right? It was very human and very normal for the twelve to believe that following Jesus Christ, the Messiah, for following him, would result in great benefit for them in inheriting the kingdom. You know, I just had a thought. This is amazing. I just had a thought. Maybe this is the reason why we don't evangelize. Because we're always caught up about what we're going to get out of heaven. We always think about what we're going to get. But we never think about what they're going to get if they don't come to Christ. We're so caught up with ourselves and what we are going to get that we don't have a heart for the lost. But to put ourselves but second and to be willing to evangelize, at least give someone a track, would be great in the kingdom of God. We always talk about our rewards in heaven, but we forget that there's a lot of people who are, who are not being showed humility or love. So they would inherit the kingdom with Christ and they would be thrusted into greatness, high position, and thus into a life of being revered and honored and admired and worshipped. And theirs would be a life of greatness by being Jesus' close followers. But it's not like that. It's just not like that. It's not. It wasn't that like that for Jesus. Exaltation or greatness in God's kingdom follows humility and self-sacrificing. And so the Lord picks up a child, he picks up an infant, a toddler in the Greek, the smallest of children, the most insignificant of children, and he places them in front of the twelve. And true greatness is never too great to welcome a child. Luke says this, they would have to become as children, where in the world they are the least, where they were the least. And this is how Luke translates it in 948. He says, He who is least among you will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Or as the NSB has it, For the one who is least among all of you, 
that would be the example of this child, the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. So the Lord answered their question concerning who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, the one who puts himself last, like the children were. They were last. They were last. As James says, 4.10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. There's no higher calling than that of an apostle. You get that? That's true. There was no greater privilege in heaven than to be an apostle. There's no higher calling today in this world than to be called into ministry. But it is not a lofty estate. It is not a glorious station. Although it may look like from that side, it never should be viewed that way from this side. It was not a lofty station to be an apostle, not according to this world's standards. Like Christ, it, it was a servant's role. It was. And all it had to be repeated again and again, they didn't live the life of a humble servant. But they would. They would, even unto death. Even unto death. They would die. And on the day when our Lord comes again to set up his rule, then they will be exalted, the twelve, but not then, not in their lifetime. I want to close this morning with Revelation 21. I want to show you something awesome. Can you turn there, Revelation 21? It's way in the back of the Bible. Revelation 21 depicts the end of the earth's history where all the chosen of God will live in what is known as the eternal state. That's after the millennial kingdom. That's after the great white throne judgment. That's after everything on earth and God's plan for earth is over with. Chapter 21 and 22 depict that time, whatever the eternal state will be. And here in Revelation 21, we see the, the new heaven and the new earth, verses 1 through 9. And what I wanted to show you is in verses 10 through 14. We see the new city, the new Jerusalem. Well, let's read it. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and the names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the Son of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Sometime in the in the the distant future when all is new, the twelve apostles, which would include Matthias, will, there ha will have their place of, place of prominence. But that will be God's doing, right? Not theirs. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. That's, that's the truth of the kingdom of God. You want greatness? You want to be great in God's kingdom? Learn to be a servant of all. Quit putting yourself first. Put yourself last. And God will see you as great. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the lesson in humility. Next week we'll see you reiterate that in the next few verses. Demonstrating, illustrating, reiterating.
Forgive us, Lord. We're humans like Peter, James, and John and the rest. We made of flesh. We have our unredeemed humanness pulling, apart, pulling on us. Forgive us. We are not humble. Our nation's not humble. We always say the greatest nation in the world. We are the greatest people of the greatest nation in the world. No one's greater than us. And it's, it's illustrated throughout our daily lives. We see that personal greatness is something to be grasped. We want to flaunt that. Humility is scoffed at and laughed at in this world, and particularly in this nation. From the very, very top to the very, very bottom. But you are not like that, and your kingdom is not like that. We are so much like the world, and we should be more like you. How will you ever conform us into the image of your son? when we are so reluctant to yield. Forgive us. Thank you that in the power of the Holy Spirit, as we saw in the beginning of the passage, in the beginning of the introduction, and through yielding ourselves to the filling of the Holy Spirit, we can walk in the Spirit. And we can be humble. Lord, I just pray you take this and drive it home to each one of us, every man, woman, and child. Let's be mindful. Let us go back into the scriptures and see how we might yield to your spirit so that we can reflect your humility and your, your servantness, servanthood. Help us, be, help us to be people of the book. Help us to be king's kids. Help us to walk worthy of the calling that we've been called to as Paul said. Help us to do that. Not for our own benefit, but for your glory. It's not about me. It's about your glory. And help us, Lord, not to be so self-centered that all we ever think about is what our rewards are going to be and we fail to realize that there's a lost and dying world out there that needs the gospel. And I am the agent of that gospel and so are these you've given me, the people, the members of Imperial Community Church. We are the agents of the gospel. Help us to focus on what is important, the here and now, not the there and then. May we do this faithfully until you come or until you take us. May we do this in Jesus' name. Amen. David, what's our closing hymn? Amen. 781. How many of you know this one? You can help me sing it. Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. Far beyond the starry skies. Only faintly now I see him But a blessed day is coming Face Far beyond the starry skies Let's sing the last, face to face. Face to face, oh blissful moment. 
us bow in prayer. Father, we pray that you go with us in the power of the Holy Spirit. May we keep our sights on your word. May we keep our sights on what you have called us to look at today. And may we do that humbly before you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.